You're listening to Tripod, the tricycle creative podcast created to help entrepreneurs be better marketers. Each episode features news, tips, interviews, and commentary from the worlds of marketing, media, and, well, miscellaneous. Now, here are your co-hosts, Ross Erosion and Chris Slezak. Hello, boys and girls. It is just me today, Ross, but I am joined by a very special guest. His name is Andrew Stallings. You're going to learn all about him uh, on this podcast. He's actually a former intern of mine, so we we go way back. Uh, But he has founded a new marketing agency that works exclusively and specifically with brands and athletes. So I wanted to bring his story to you. Um, there's a, there's just a lot of great stuff that we talk about in this conversation. Um, we talk about mistakes athletes make with their marketing. We talk about storytelling. We talk about monetization. We talk about how his company, Othello, how they work. How does a brand, whether it's non-sports or a sports brand, collaborate with athletes? How does he bring them together? Community culture, scalability, and then at the end, we have a fun with, uh, with a little word association game, sports style. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Let's get on with the show. So Andrew, thank you for joining the, I guess, I don't know if it's a fraternity or a sorority or a grander, the organization that is guests who have been on the Tripod, Tricycle Creative podcast. No, I really appreciate you having me, Ross. And I think this is going to be one that's probably a little bit more eclectic than some of your previous <laughs> guests, given the rooted relationship at hand here. It's very true. So Andrew and I go way back um, to... Um, another time in my life where I was running, um, an internship program at Sirius XM an award winning, let's, let's give myself a little pat on the back here, an award winning (laughs) internship program at Sirius XM satellite radio. And Andrew was one of the interns that I brought on, um, not my personal intern, uh, although we hung out a fair amount. Um, I brought you on for in the sports department, correct? That is correct. At the 11th hour, might I add, um, helping me out in a big way. (laughs) Look at me being a nice guy. Look at that. Well, I appreciate you coming in, not so much at the 11th hour, but at some hour of the day and, uh, and being a part of this, this podcast, because I'm excited, you know, being an entrepreneur, it certainly has its ups and downs, has its peaks and valleys. And it never fails that whenever I'm in kind of a, a valley or a, a down down, um, I I look at or even I get messaged by former interns because I had probably a f- over all the time I did the internship program at SiriusXM I probably have a, a, a thousand I'll say kids you're no longer a kid so don't yeah. don't you know but who came through the doors and I see the awesome things that they are doing um, and it really brings a smile to my face and i even think it was kind of speaking of roots some of the foundational root stuff that led me to start tricycle creative which is really a marketing agency that's built upon helping make better marketers training them and teaching people and things like that and um so i was really excited to see that you have started um your own thing we got to kind of our worlds collided a little with, um, was it food and wine, Austin food and wine? It, it was, um, yeah. that was, that was when I was working, uh, with an experiential events agency and, uh, we needed, uh, some last second photography and video help for an event for a client of ours. And lo and behold, the one man in Austin, Texas, I can call <laughs> is 11th Ross hour, man. The 11th hour, man. <laughs> the 11th hour. <laughs> this is going to be my, my new website I need to get. I'm gonna, I have to get that right now before anyone steals it. Um, so <laughs> so why, don't we, why don't we start, uh, not at the beginning, that's too long of a story. Why don't we start really um, where you are now? So, so in three sentences or less, tell me about your business and what you do. Yeah. So currently I run a sports consulting practice that helps professional athletes in niche categories enhance their brands from a 360 degree model. 
uh, pretty much by giving them resources, consulting, uh, different sponsorship opportunities and, and different uh, collaboration opportunities to pretty much take their brand and their network to the next level. Uh, on the other side, we do work with brands and agencies to help them understand the different methods and ways of working with professional athletes by identifying and executing against uh, a very unique creative asset portfolio, which we're able to build with them. And with that, it really helps them kind of formulate these longer term and more engaging relationships even if they're not, you know, 100% based on monetary value, uh, you know, from the get go, there's a lot of opportunity in the long run, uh, when you have these formulated relationships that help both sides, uh, you know, bring it to the next level. So basically, we're, we're rooted in two words, uh, the word athletes and opportunities. And once you smash those together, uh, that's basically how you get Othello. So with Othello, you're bringing you're bringing to the table the the brands and the athletes and you're figuring out something that that is work going to work for both of them and i mean is that the most dumbest down of boiled down purest essence of of what you guys are doing right now yeah, it's it's basically a two swim lane approach to helping both sides of the table figure out how to communicate and how to work together in a more effective manner. So the athletes that we're working with, Ross, are very niche category athletes. So we focus a lot on the rising sports properties like UFC, motorsports, esports, action sports, golf, tennis, even soccer in North America. And we are ultimately building out and tapping into some of the biggest properties and talents and helping them figure out ways of enhancing the opportunities that they have in front of them and also figuring out how to do it in a creative and really scalable way. And with the on the other side in the swim lane, the brands and the agencies they think they know everything because it's everything's data driven. And, I, and I, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure we're going to get into this conversation. Mm-hmm. But data in a lot of ways is the enemy because it seems to be this black and white crutch that a lot of people lean on that defines influencer marketing and partnership marketing. And, you know, it, what so many people don't understand is that there's a lot more behind what we do in a lot of our relationships and business exchanges than just data. And you have to just be able to challenge it and you have to be willing to challenge that and bring those different creative solutions to the table. And we've done that with a lot of big brands and we've done it with a lot of small ones too. So it's it's really a category where we're kind of you know, on this boat in the middle of the ocean with a, like, not a lot of people around us. And it's it's invigorating. It's humbling. Um, but every once in a while, there's a big tide and current that comes and, and knocks you off your rocker. <laughs> but it's uh, it's been a challenging experience these last two years. And um, I'm certainly happy to talk to you a little bit more about it here today. You didn't know this, but I was really coming uh, into this with with some pitches of some new niche sports that I was hoping you could get some representation for. Um, cause I've been watching these on the Ocho, um, <laughs> ax throwing. Um, okay. if you could get an ax thrower, I think that would be a huge boon to your business. Um, you're writing these down, right? You're, 100%. you're getting these. Okay. Fantastic. Yep. Yep. Um, also, um, this, I think actually showed after ax throwing and that was, um, collegiate cornhole. So really not, not pro. <laughs> Andrew, come on. The pros, we've all seen it. We all know it. We all we all know the pro circuit of cornhole. Okay. It's just tired. We've all it's too much. They're on the billboards. They're on they're on bumper stickers. They're on cell phone cases. What we really want is the up and coming collegiate cornholer. All right. So if you could pass those along to the to the other people in your company, I won't even take a cut. This is just one that I thought was a real real great opportunity for you um, that I wanted to 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 really put in front of you, put on your radar. So I I hope that was that that's helpful. That that those two are 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 I think areas of oppor- Let's call them areas of opportunity. How yeah. About that? Well, well, Ross, you're such a giver, as we all know. Well, uh, of course. I just <laughs> I try. <laughs> so when you work with these athletes. And maybe let's start maybe with the athletes. What mistakes do you see them making when it comes to their, I I like to use content marketing because I feel like content plugs into everything, whether it is a Facebook ad, whether it is a social post, whether it is an Instagram, but, but whatever it is, it doesn't matter. A video at the end of the day, content is what drives digital marketing. So 
My question is, what mistakes do you see them making or what do you commonly hear them coming to the table saying they need help with? Yeah, well, I think the the number one thing that you always hear anytime that we engage a new athlete is how much money can you make me and how much money can you make me through influencer marketing? Can you do through social media, uh, branding, merchandising? Uh, you know, a lot of these athletes we deal with, uh, they they say, look, I have an agent that can sign my team deal and can get me my Nike deal for my boots. But I I want all this extra money. I want the Nivea face cream. I want the avocados from Mexico deal. Like I, I want whatever it is. And the funny thing is the opportunities do exist, but it is a very quick, like just a reality check when I have a conversation with these athletes and tell them that money isn't everything. And you have to get that out of your mind very, very quickly. And you have to really fact check in the mirror by saying, why am I doing this? Why am I doing content? Why am I building my brand? And I think so many people from a marketing standpoint, not just athletes, but brand individuals really need to ask them, themselves that every once in a while, Ross. They need to really just remind themselves and ask, like, why am I doing this? What's the reasoning? What's the cause? What's the root? And the thing with these athletes is that they think, okay, I play soccer on an MLS team or an NWSL team or an Olympic team. And just by default, because I wear that kit 100% I'm going to get fans, you know, even if I play only five minutes a game and that's fine. That's how my social media is going to grow up and that's how it's going to blow up. And from there, I'm able to figure out and evolve, you know, how to make money from it. Now, Othello Group make me money. And what I always tell them is, okay, cool, that's great. And I'm happy to make you money in any way that I can. But what's your story? And it's the biggest conversation stopper that that I have every single time. They're like, well, I don't know. I'm an athlete. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, cool. Where are you from? And they're like, oh, you know, I'm from, you know, uh, New Mexico. Okay, cool. Tell me more about you. Like, what, what, like, tell me about your family, your friends, your passions. You would be so surprised how many people, and, I, and actually, you're probably not too surprised. You probably talk to tons of people that when you start turning the, the script around on them, they have no idea how to answer these questions. So externally communicating that to their audience, it's like stage fright. And especially when you're measuring everything by, oh my gosh, like how many comments I got, how many likes I got, how many views I got, then it becomes really in your head. But the number one mistake that I see a lot of athletes make is, is really losing their focus on the popularity of what they're doing and the monetization focus of what they're doing and really finding the cause and, and rooting themselves in a cause as to who they are, what they're trying to communicate and what they stand for. Once you identify that, Everything else is out the window, and usually you can overcome a lot of obstacles, a lot of fears, and a lot of hurdles in order to really identify their brand and develop it in a different light. You know, it's interesting to me that you bring that up, that the, the, the number one or the biggest thing is this focus on monetization. Because on the flip side, and you probably saw this in your former agency work, but but particularly with, with my work, working with fellow small businesses, medium-sized businesses, solopreneurs, and even some even large businesses, it is the same challenge, right? And the challenge is, how do I make money off of this? Now, I understand completely that that, in essence, is the flip side, if you will, to marketing, right? They are the flip sides of a coin. Marketing leads to sales, leads to revenue, right? But I think that that is a very simplistic approach of how you plug in digital marketing. And, and you touched on a little, I, th I, I don't want to get into right now, but like the analytics piece and, and, and things like that is everyone is trying to figure out how do I use, let's even use social media. How do I use social media to make money? And you have... I feel like if you approach it that way, first and foremost, then what you are doing is just applying old methodology to new platforms. Like, okay, I, the first time I talk to you, all I want to do is talk about sell, sell, sell. Mm -hmm. And this is what I tell my clients is, you know, it's like, you cannot, this is social media is now relationship marketing and community building. And it's permission marketing, which mm -hmm. is, if I remember, I, that's a Seth Godin thing, that it's yep. permission marketing, it that, that these particular, that the people who follow you are saying, 
I like something about you. Maybe it's that you are my nephew. Okay, fine. Right. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's that you, I like to surf. Maybe it's that you are from New Mexico. Maybe it's that you were on TV. I like something about you or your business. And I now am going to follow you or sign up for your newsletter to give you permission to talk to me. Right. And that is a, people do not put enough value or emphasis on that relationship. It is commoditized. That's like, Oh, got a new sign up, got a new, this got a new like that kind of thing. They don't appreciate how special that is. And they take it for granted. And what they want to try and do is only then push sell, 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 make money, 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 money. And think about that experience. Think about why people hate going to a dealership, a car mm-hmm. dealership, because that's what is, that's what the old school car dealer did. You know, they felt a little skeevy. All they did was pr- kind of pressure you. They kept just pushing you. And that is what you're doing to people who follow you. If you're not thinking about community building, mm-hmm. build, you know, the content you're creating to your, to the story you are telling. I love storytelling. That is what brands, people, athletes, whatever, that should be the focus. And I think yeah. you use a sports thing. You know, I usually throw this away, but it's just to say, if you build it, they will come. If you build the stadium like that, they will come. Yeah. Well, so all of that is 100% accurate, but let me explain to you a little bit about how we root what we do into Othello Group and how everything that you're saying is 100% spot on. So a lot of these athletes come to us from some of the big name agencies, uh, some of the big name sports and entertainment agencies. And they say, look, I was a number on a list. I was number 57 on a roster list of 120 for my agent. And I always had to deal with his assistant or his assistant's assistant if I ever really needed something. And sometimes these opportunities fall in the laps of the athletes, not even the agents. So say if you're an athlete and you're like, oh my gosh, I was just at this brunch and I met the head of global soccer marketing for Nike. Hey, I would love to introduce my agent to that. So to to see if something can be figured Mm -hmm. out as far as opportunities or events, the agent's too busy with his top five athletes that they can't even make that happen. So the number one thing I always rooted myself in with the fellow group was making myself available and making our team available to the athletes that are on retainer on our roster. Now on our roster, we have about 15 professional athletes all from different sports. Every single one of them has 100% access to myself and my team around the clock whenever they need it. If they have legal trouble, if they have tax questions, if they have social media and content uh, questions, you know, some of them have random deals where, look, they're just jet lagged and they can't think of a caption for this paid advertisement or post that they have to do. We're happy to massage and throw ideas at the wall for them. But also we are constantly bringing them to the table for new communication efforts, for new meetings, for new events, philanthropic endeavors, and all of these things we're not doing for them. We're doing with them. And I'm educating these athletes and I'm showing them that, look, when your ath- when your when your athlete's career is over in the next five, 10, 15 years, whatever it may be, that you are as educated as our team and you're able to say, Andrew, thank you so much. I'm going to be able to run with this on my own. And I'm giving you the power of education through our services and our model of what we do. It's very similar to what you do, Ross. You, you empower and educate a lot of marketers to show them different met- methodologies and ways of thinking to do certain things with us. I don't want to represent. I want to collaborate and I want to do with my team and I want to build it in a more constructive, cohesive environment that helps them be educated and grow well beyond the world of sports. And that is what has made us so successful. We haven't had one athlete leave us in two years. We have about 17 brands on retainer, none of which have left with a complaint and ones that constantly are coming back for some smaller projects and bigger ones. And Honestly, it's all rooted in the mentality of which you and I have a lot of the same commonalities uh, commonalities on is that you're from North Carolina area. I'm from Southern Virginia. And besides loving cheer wine, we're yes, ma'am, no, ma'am people. And we we get people. We read people. We use our manners. And honestly, that stuff 
like when you used to live in New York and how I live right outside of New York now, it it it, it blows people away that people like you and I exist in in these environments. But it's like the smallest things that are what it's it's what makes us successful. It's what makes our athletes and our partners successful. And it really is genuine kindness and genuine education, genuine help and assistance that really is changing the model for what I'm doing. And it's honestly, it's quite pathetic that, that this is this is the one thing that's really making me switch and, and make myself different from a top tier agent at one of the biggest global agencies in the world. So, you know, I, you said what I will say during my initial consultation calls with people, and that is um, that I work with my clients, I do not work for my clients. Mm-hmm. And if they, if their hair, you know, if they kind of, you know, retract from that, then they're probably not a right fit because I have found in doing, and even with my, by extension, my team working with people who are not invested in their own marketing, in their own story, we just are not as successful as a whole. It's just, you know, there are certainly components of content, digital marketing that we do video graphics, logo, that kind of blog writing. Um, because we have, you know, I guess maybe like an athlete, we, we, you know, we have, we have pro level people at, uh, to help our clients with that. But I, I am, I'm with you, man. Like that's where we are kind of a kin kinship there. And I am a big believer in making better marketers and getting to a point where they may feel like, they can do their day to day. They can do their marketing on their own. And then I tell people when I first talked to them, I said, the day that my clients come to me and say, they got this and maybe they don't need us anymore. That's not a loss. Like that's a success for me. And oftentimes what happens is they, they say, we got this, but now we want to do more. And so we continue to work with our clients. So I, I, I'm a, have always been uh, a big proponent of, you know, um, teaching and educating. And I've been lucky enough to bring that. It sounds like very much like you into kind of an, an, an agency um, model and working with clients. So um, I want to shift gears a little bit now and go from the athlete to the brands that you work with, specifically the non-sports brands. So, how can a non-sports brand benefit from working with an athlete? Where do you even begin? Uh, so I think a lot of it is is rooted in whatever your current marketing or campaign efforts are, whether that be national or regional. That's usually the number one question I have is, is what's your current focus on marketing and communication for your brand? And help me understand that a little bit more. And once I'm able to understand kind of three layers deeper to that message and an overall output that the, the brand or company has committed to, regardless of whatever category they're playing in, I'm able to slowly start plugging in pieces to the rest of the puzzle. And I'm able to say, OK, well, do you have an event strategy? Yes. Okay. So you're doing what trade shows? Oh, okay. You're doing 5k and 10k series to promote, um, your partnership with a local, uh, philanthropic or health effort or endeavor. Awesome. Well, have you ever thought about maybe just recruiting a, a localized talent, like an ultra marathon runner, somebody that's super engaged and super engaged on social, but also in their community efforts and, and also even this specific, um, this health cause to take it to the next level. It, those simple questions and answers help me pull back the easiest layers of the onion to, to uncover and unravel and explore. And it really is just a matter of, of the soft questions, helping people figure out exactly where their marketing efforts exist currently. And once that's all laid out on the table, it's asking and kind of going by trial and error does this work for you? Yes or no. Have you considered this? Yes or no. Is there enough money to do this? Yes or no. Have you thought about this off the wall, create a partnership with this different category sponsor? No. Yes. And from there it's an exercise. So we actually have a 32 question onboarding questionnaire 
that we do with all of our brands. We don't just hand it over to them and we don't hand it over to all the agencies we work with either. We walk through it step by step because as you know, especially with conversations like this and with even with the podcast, you can script it one way, but it's especially when you talk to me, it's going to go left field. So <laughs> I knew that coming in. So I was yeah. prepared. Yeah, I, I was well prepared for that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, and same goes, you know, when you have these conversations, if you're making progress, you're not going to stick to the script. So we always come to find that, you know, we probably get two, three, four questions in. And if we're down to like question seven or eight, and we're just going down a checklist and checking boxes that exactly what you just said, this relationship probably isn't going to work because they're not that interested and they're not challenging themselves on discovering the opportunities and what creative solutions are available. Or it's honestly just not a chemistry fit. And that's probably another big miss too in a lot of partnerships today, whether it's with brand or athletes, is so many people just don't get that certain things just don't mesh and vibe. You know, certain people don't like each other. Some people are type A, some people are type B, and that does affect business, but that is okay. Now, that doesn't mean that you should just give up. You should always try to find alternatives and solutions, which is what, you know, I myself always try to do. But at the same time, sometimes people just tell you to shut up and walk away. And that's okay. But never, ever let a door be closed 100%, locked, bolted, and chained right in your face. Because the minute that that happens, you have lost. And you haven't lost the business, you've lost yourself. Because you're not challenging yourself creatively enough, and you're not doing it for the right reasons to have these relationships. Sometimes you have to put business aside, and you have to be a human. And you have to be able to go to the table and try and find solutions that genuinely are going to be you know, beneficial to them, regardless of what kind of price or investment you want to do. And it's, it's humanized marketing. And again, it goes back to what we were saying. It's, it's a unique approach. It's a scalable approach that a lot of businesses are just afraid to do because you don't normally get the orca whale of a business deal <laughs> by doing this. So, you know, that I, I don't even know where I was going with that. But it that, would that, seem to me that a non-sports brand, you know, uh, the, a, a big part of the conversation to even working with an athlete gets boiled down to audience and story. Right. Like, you know, what's the target audience you're trying to reach? What's your particular story or what you're trying to tell? And I think those would be opportunities where athletes as humans with their achievements and struggles and failures and their own story, where you almost have this like Venn diagram, if you will, of the athlete's story and the brand's story. Am I, am I, am, am, am I barking up the right tree there when it comes to aligning a non-brand and an athlete or a non-sports brand and an athlete? Absolutely. A much shorter way of, of putting it than I did before. Uh, well, no, I mean, I just, because I, 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 I think that, you know, um, athlete, so look at, at the time of this recording, we are a couple days away from a Super Bowl. And we have actually just come out of a, a, a sports related tragedy with Kobe Bryant dying um, and his and his daughter dying in a, in a helicopter crash. But you look at how Kobe's legacy and and as an athlete supersedes the world of athletics. Right. I mean, L.A. is essentially kind of in morning like he was bigger than this and it seems to me like that those are the types of opportunities even again with these with the with the, these these very accomplished talented you know niche sports athletes to connect them to non-sports brands absolutely community and culture supersedes everything and you have to be willing to tell and explore the efforts of what you're doing within your own personal surroundings and not so much look at what you're putting out and communicating just on social media because it goes to the model of, of the uninterrupted and LeBron James model of always being more than an athlete. And I think these brands always have to explore and see what is – the narrative a little bit further beyond what I'm just seeing on social media. And that is something that we challenge every single brand that we talk to to do because look, they're rooted in sustainability, but why? They're they're rooted in causes for the ocean and beach cleanups. Why? And I think 
once you challenge the why about three times, you're mm-hmm. able to really get to the core nucleus of of emotion and enigma of what makes a human being and an athlete tick. And that's ultimately what leads to great partnerships. So how do you balance that kind of, or, or maybe even <clears throat> scale, if you will, big and small with working with a really big brand that maybe for lack of a better word is super needy and uh, maybe a smaller brand that is, uh, pun intended, easier to play play ball with. You know, they're more open to that. How do you how do you manage or or you know is there a scalability play for for your company or for your business on dealing with the different needs and expectations of these brands? Yeah, so I mean, the budget question is always something that we start with, um, whether good or bad. It has to be. It has to be had. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, because if a brand is coming to the table and they're saying, "Yeah, we expect you to help us work with you know five different athletes across all these different categories," and our budget just for you is this, but we don't have any budget to leverage talent and athletes. You know, then it becomes a little bit more difficult as far as, you know, the needs and the assets. And then it becomes another rotisserie and round of questions that you have to ask about the assets. You know, so it's like, okay, have you thought about the content? Have you thought about the campaign? And ultimately, we always have to go back to the brands and say, what are we doing? You know, what is the root cause? Is this a photo shoot? Is this a one-off campaign? You know, what, what is it that we're doing? And then once we can develop that and build all of that out, it always is a matter of scalability for us. You know, we we don't want to be the agency or the company that comes in and says, sure, this is going to be $500,000 to do this because a lot of other companies and agencies will do that. And we don't want to be like those companies. You know, for me, I, I want to be able to help you as efficiently and as effectively as I can. But you have to understand and you have to challenge yourself to think exactly how you want to get creative with this relationship, both in the short term and both in the long term. So we are always challenging them by asking them what's the short term and long term goals. And I think from there, they're able to answer a lot of their own questions in the process. And that really helps us identify and figure out what kind of relationship are we building? Is it a one off, you know, quick thing? Or is this something where we're really building ambassadors, you know, for this Mm -hmm. brand, for this company, and the people that want to carry this flag and do it for many other years? There are some companies out there that are really doing it right. And they're doing it by not even paying these athletes. They're really giving them opportunities and mm-hmm. they're giving them product, but they're giving them very unique experiences, opportunities. And I tell you what, there are few that are doing it right, but there's one or two in particular that we've worked with and we haven't exchanged a dollar. But mm-hmm. the relationship that they've been able to kind of build an affinity with, with a couple of our athletes has been second to none. And I give their marketing team so much credit because it is a very, very challenging and difficult thing to do, but they've done it right. And they bring value, not just to the athletes, but to us as well. So what are you excited about right now? Whether it's for your, for (laughs) Othello specifically, you personally, your athletes, technology, social, whatever. What, what is like the thing that, that you are just super jazzed about right now? You're, you're going to hear every single day about people who love social and digital. You know, I, I was that way for, for so long about what was the next social and, and digital trend. Uh, you know, whether it was cutting edge technology, whether it was a new app, I was always fascinated by what seems to now dominate us in every single thing that we do. Um, personally, I'm more excited on finding an opportunity in an area that a lot of people aren't playing in for my own personal business. But I think for society, original MySpace. Exactly. Is that where, is that where you're the guy? I, I knew I'm, it. I'm, I knew I'm, you were there. I'm Tom. Whoa. I, I'm, I'm literally Tom. What a what an expose. <laughs> I had no idea this was like a, like an NPR podcast all of a sudden. Oh my goodness. Okay. Sorry. I interrupt. Sorry. No, no. Uh, but I, you know, I think the number one thing I'm paying attention to moving forward is how brands uh, really find the biggest challenge of disconnecting from social, digital, and electronic media. And they're able to humanize life experiences, uh, events, 
and not just do it from a gimmicky experiential play, but look at a company like REI that every Black Friday they shut their doors and they oh, yeah. encourage, encourage, encourage everybody to go outside. Like for me, those are the kind of things that I'm really – taking an interest into because if you look at the world now we can't turn on the news without some new climate change or sustainable action or you know, politics or religion it's it's always something negative and i think maybe it's just because i'm getting old now but i i i'm so addicted to my phone because of work and everything i have to do so anything that can force me to not be on it and to actually look around breathe and yeah. appreciate everything around me is you have take take all my money like that is something that's that truly the game changer, right? I mean, yeah. that's the thing. The thing that gets you out of your phone, interestingly enough, is the thing. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. And I think because you're, you're going back and forth now, we've hit our peak with social and digital and electronics and now everyone's addicted, right? So now yeah. who's going to be the brand that comes and becomes super disruptive and does everything by getting us not addicted and brings us back to like the 1970s mindset that we just need to dance and go to a pub yeah. and diner and and live our lives you know and go to drive in movies like that's what we need like you know need- it sounds it i don't know if you have these where you are but um the one thing i i love i have no idea if as a business it is working for them but uh capital one the capital one lounges yeah. Are you familiar with these? I am. I am. Do, you, do they, awesome. they, 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 have you been to one or they're, they're where you are, right? I think, yes. I don't know how rolled out they are nationwide or whatever. Um, they're fantastic. They're essentially free co working spaces. You go in, it has a coffee shop in there. You can go, it has free internet. Not pushy at all. If you happen to have a Capital One card, your coffee's like 50% off. And if you, want to open an account, have a question about your account. There's someone there. They're just it's, there. They're not it's, pushed. It's I just, to your point of like being this experiential thing that you, that, that you're a part of without it feeling heavy, without it feeling heavy handed, maybe, you know, like it, I love that, that, experiment. I don't know if it's going to be an experiment for them, but I think it's really cool. Yeah, and I think it's I mean, a better use of space than a stupid bank. Yeah. I mean, you're getting a lot more people in that space interacting with capital one than if it were some bank with a teller and an ATM in there. A hundred percent. And right? how, and how, if you are a brand that is nostalgically boring, like a bank, totally. how do you, yeah. how, how do yeah. you keep yourself, how do you keep yourself relevant? You know, like, yeah, we, we need banks, right. But no one wants to go work, oh. you know, and, and do something. Like, no one. I, I, and if anyone responds to this and tells you, I actually was dreaming to be a banker my entire life. I like, don't, BS. we don't market this towards bankers. So yeah. <laughs> bankers, if you're out there unsubscribe no don't no don't unsubscribe i was kidding <laughs> we'll do a bank episode someday i'm working on it right now right right my my dad was a banker for 48 years he's probably listening to this right now and he's just oh shaking his fist God. he's like damn he's, you he's <laughs> at his teller machine he's so mad is he wear the green visor he has to, to the counterfeits and yeah um no i mean i think it's just it's it's an interesting thing because you look at yes banks are boring and snoozy right so much of it so much of banking is now done online okay but i do i agree with you in bringing things everything cyclical so bringing things kind of back to a in person experience mm-hmm. but thinking in it in the modern capacity and that modern capacity particularly where i am in austin texas is a big push towards remote work and entrepreneurialism yeah so it's like it like hits all these you know, it just hits all these things correctly. Um, and and for me, what I'm super excited about is is similar to you. Like I'm excited about this transformation of or, or maybe the prioritization of storytelling and content. That storytelling and content is now the focus, whether it's SEO. And that's in part because Google is getting smarter with AI and that you're now not writing for Google, you're writing for people. So you're just, you're telling your story smarter and better. You're not having to tweak it in a way so that a robot understands it. I think it allows 
people to tell their story exactly as it's meant to be told online. And when it comes to storytelling and even content creation, obviously the rise of video, but even very recently, you know, the, the, you know, the, even the rise of something like a TikTok, you know, which is not status driven. It's content driven. That's really interesting to me. You know, social platforms that are not driven by status, that they are driven by, I'm going to say talent <laughs> <laughs> as a, maybe in, 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 as a knock against those who are just, it's, it's, it's all style and no substance. It's a lot more substance, you know, mm. and that's, what's, what's kind of driving the ship. So, um, let me ask you something real quick. So yeah. do you do you think that content storytelling is going to pivot away from social anytime in the near future? And if so, how? Oh, man. I think that people are getting smarter, at least the people I work with, are getting smarter about how to utilize social to tell the story in different ways. I think the biggest challenge people have is thinking that all of the social platforms are created equal and that they all work the same way and do the same thing. And you can post the same content on them. And I, that's just philosophically that that's not how they're built. They're all very different. Um, that, you have to understand you're telling your story in different ways. Um, even if it's the same story, you know, it's, I guess, taken all the way back to like, okay, you have a printed book, but then you have a Kindle book, but then you have an audio book, but then you have the movie about the book and then you have the movie poster, right? These are yeah. all essentially around the same story, but they're completely different. They are all complete. And then you have the movie trailer, right? They're mm -hmm. all completely different and they're utilized in different ways. So I don't know. I, I think a lot to, I think there's a lot to be said for what happens with Facebook. I'd say even in the near future, um, because it still is kind of King, but my space was King for a while too. You know, like it was, but Facebook, to your earlier thing, like it feels like its roots are deeper in, you know, whether nefarious or not. It, it just seems like they are just deeper entrenched in not only marketing, but I would even say culturally. Um, so so I don't know. I, I, I would say that social sh will become a vehicle, but it seems like the, the networks are are trying to mature in their own separate ways. If, I mean, it used to be that every network was trying to be everything. And right. it seems like a little bit now that that, that pendulum is swinging back the other way where it's, while they may have more features and they're doing that, it's, it's more thoughtful. Do you agree? I mean, I, I don't know. I, yeah. I, I, so I think that last point is spot on. I think there's beginning to be a more emotional connection with marketing and every single thing that we do. And I at least see, even with some of the, the younger individuals in my life, you know, I, I also coach a women's high school hockey team and oh my goodness, like if you want to talk about a social case study, like never before, mm. uh, it's that, <laughs> but you know, it's the, the one thing that I continue to see though, is even at that age, they're getting tired of Snapchat, of Instagram, of TikTok because it's, it's sensory overload and it burns people out. And what I, I, you know, I'm calling my shot right now. I think in the next two to three years at most, I would even, even venture to argue the next 18 months, we are going to see a monumental shift in how marketing is done. Um, at least in North America, yep. because I think there's way too much going on. I think that there's too many different avenues, too many experts, too many media channels. I think it's all way too much. And I think, Someone is going to completely reinvent the wheel by doing it a hundred percent simple. And yeah. I think it's going to be all rooted in emotion and what you need and what you never even thought that you needed. And I have no idea if it's going to be a product form, if it's going to be a communication form. I don't know that, but I think that it's coming and I cannot wait for when it does come because I think it is going to be the start of a better world 
than what we're engulfed in with all the negativity right now. Yeah, me too. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I welcome that for sure. And I, and it is, I don't know if the right word is ironic. Maybe it's that it's expected, but I would say in the past two years, you know, I myself have even found as a user of social platforms, like I exhausted. I barely, I mean, I barely even do it personally myself because it's, it's, it, I got to a point where, so I am, I am 37 years old. Okay. But I got to a point where I didn't feel like I was experiencing things in the moment. I was so obsessed with capturing them versus experiencing them. It's kind of the old thing of like recording, being obsessed with like recording video while you're at a concert. And I, I look at people who do that or, and I'm like, who's watching that? Who, what are you going to do with that? Like after this, the audio is going to be terrible. Your picture is blurry. Like <laughs> the actual experience is the thing. The capturing is like they they have, or if it's even like, I don't know, like I, I stopped experiencing things in a positive way. And so I stepped back and I have found that to be a better experience for me. Now, obviously approaching things for businesses is a little bit different, but I would even say a big part of what the coaching I do with my clients, they feel this compulsion that they have to do more. And in reality, oftentimes they can do less, just be more thoughtful about it. You nailed it. And you are officially a grandpa, by the way. Oh, <laughs> you darn kids and your video cameras at the concerts. Just put them down. I have one last, last thing that I want to ask. And this is going to be a word association game. You're, you're, you are, you are, you deal with sports. Is it, may I say that you love sports? Is that, I don't want to be misquoted. I don't know if that is a, uh, you are a sports enthusiast. Uh, that, right? That's fair. That's fair. Okay. Yep. I am going to say some words and then I want you to just give me the first words that come to your mind. <clears throat> Houston Astros cheating scandal. Humbling. Michael Jordan. Leader. This one's you, you, you're not, you wouldn't have thought I was going to go this way, but I know you like hockey. So I'm going to say Wayne Gretzky. Innovator. Super Bowl. Overrated. Oh my God. Whoa. <laughs> Hard stop on that one. I'm, leave, I'm leaving to go down there tomorrow, too. And I'm very much not looking 100% forward to it, my man. We wow, wow, yeah. I covered uh, many a Super Bowl, and they're very, um, they're, uh, poof, they're blurry. I don't remember them very well. Not because I was drunk or on drugs. I just want to clarify <laughs> that. But when you work those types of things, you know, I had a, I had a boss. I, I would always get deployed to cover as kind of like a solo content producer for a lot of like sports things and music, whatever. And he, and, and, and I'd have a boss and he would show up and he'd say, you never look like you're having fun at these things. I was like, bro, I'm, I'm working it. I'm here. I'm here working it so you can have fun at it. You know? So I have, I have a little bit of a, whatever. Yeah. Miami should be nice right now. So you should be where you're, where your sunscreen you're pale like me, if I remember correctly. Yeah. But lots of rain in the forecast. So not looking too uh, hot. Okay. I'm not done yet. I have more Go. Uh, um, hockey life. Yeah. You're a big hockey fan. What's your, what's who's your team? Uh, <laughs> the Washington capitals and soon to be, uh, back and that wouldn't be back to back, but two times Stanley cup champions Whoa. after this season, it'll happen. It'll happen. Which, which do you have more faith in? 
your 18 month prediction of marketing being shaken up or that the Washington Capitals will do will be back to back champions? Honestly, 18 month prediction. I, really, oh. I, I think it's going to happen. I do. I, something's going to happen, man. OK. Um, soccer. Evolving. I would agree with you. I think soccer is poised to have significant play in North America. It is. It is. It, and it's because the, the sport is so traditional and classic in a lot of ways, but there is a lot of room of growth in the game and not just in the males, uh, male side of it, but obviously in the female side, but the youth development game too is arguably it's the, one of the biggest youth sports in North America, but there's such yeah, a it's weird. Ball. It doesn't translate. I mean, that's like, it, the, it, it's, it's a huge youth sport, but then it just seems to, you know, it, 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 it I don't know. It, that just doesn't translate on after that. Well, it's, it's because strange. they haven't had the professional uh, properties and brands um, that have been like the tier one platforms, like the Premier yeah. League and La Liga, like they do overseas. And it's just it's a it's a tougher barrier. But I think in the next few years, you're going to see a lower barrier of entry for people that actually have an affinity for that sport to really make it a much larger career, uh, regardless of how they transition into it and at what point. I think depending on how the NFL deals with all the head injury stuff too, the, that that could be in play. Also. For sure. For sure. Okay, just a couple more. Yep. Bryce Harper. <sighs> how many words am I allowed to use? <laughs> as one? many as you want. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this is a this can be a labeled as an explicit podcast. So uh, feel okay. free to uh, use whatever word you like. You know, I, I would say egotistical. I, I think I think Bryce Harper is a great case study uh, when you look at athletes because he uh, man, the whole city of Washington, D.C. turned on him in so many ways. And the writing was on the wall to a lot of people. And Washington Nationals fans will never admit it. But take a look at when the Capitals were in their Stanley Cup run. Bryce Harper's a, a Las Vegas native and he would be going to the Capitals games in a Las Vegas Golden Knight jersey. And, you know, as like someone that's rooted in that community and you're arguably the biggest sports star in town at that time, besides the one player on the ice, look, man, you, you got to balance your allegiances a little bit. You got to play the game. And Bryce Harper, he's just from what I've seen. And I think the move to Philadelphia has balanced him out a little bit and it's been humbling. But, you know, he was a very egotistical athlete in in what you saw in a lot of ways. But you know what? That doesn't mean that he didn't do a lot of good and that he's still not a great player. But I, I think there was a lot of ego involved for sure for, for a baseball player, um, you know, which of somebody that could really have, have done a lot of things. I think his ego held him back in a lot of ways. Super Bowl style, Patty Mahomes. The next great thing. I, I, I love his energy. I, I love his. So his agent um, has actually been someone I've never really met uh, face to face. But Jacqueline Dahl, who is the uh, wife of famous uh, Colorado Rockies outfielder David Dahl, um, started her own sports agency after working with like a variety of other athletes. And she has been working with Mahomes since he came into the league. And she is actually doing a lot of incredible work, uh, you know, from what I understand from a lot of other colleagues who know her very well. She's done an incredible job of of really m helping him market, but also embracing, you know, his family, his community and kind of bringing all of that as like a forefront message and not let it be, you know, kind of the back or shadow of who he is. You see Patrick Mahomes, but you also see a lot of his family and his father, who was a former athlete, you know, his brother, who's constantly, you know, <laughs> making funny yep. TikTok videos. Like there's so much about Patrick Mahomes that's extended. If you really look at him bigger than just the, the, uh, uh, Kansas City Chiefs quarterback. And I, and I love that. I, I think that he offers a, a great variety of um, different eccentric uh, traits for an athlete. And I would even say, you know, I, I, I like him at the front of the pack for the new guard. You yep. Know? So I agree. All right. Tim Tebow. Huh. Mm. Case study? I, yeah. I, don't, I, I think, you know, it, he's a great case study to look at as far as you know kind of looking at what's next in your professional career mm -hmm. um you know so as i mentioned we're going to super bowl next week and, and one of the the events that one of my athletes is doing is a, a event called tackle what's next and it is specifically focused and harnessed around professional athletes 
uh, looking at what's next in the chapter of their career. And Tim Tebow is someone that has completely capitalized on it. You know, now granted, he's a good looking dude and, you know, he has been able to really diversify and grab on to, from a media perspective and stuff like that. But dude, minor league baseball and working your yeah. way up and completely go into a different sport and not it's just wild. like, uh, yeah, and not just like signing with a major league baseball team and being on that team. He's gone through the farm system from the very bottom and worked his way up organically. I respect that. And, and you I, know, I, I actually think he's, you know, I am, um, uh, not a particularly religious person. I know that was the big thing that all the hoopla that came along with it. But I, I, I actually do have respect for, for him. And I would even say that, you know, um, I don't even know if he was given a fair shake. All right. Last one. This is a big one. This is a big one. You're going to really need to have to think about this one. Okay. Probably no, prob, 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 arguably, arguably top basketball player. George Mirasan. Shoot. <laughs> Who? George I, Mirasan. Uh, yeah. He, it's, you stumped me. I, I did? I, you stumped me. He was like an eight foot guy. He oh, played, the he bullets. He smells like cabbage from yeah. Billy Crystal yeah. movies. <laughs> so maybe there it's Renaissance Man would be yeah. my thing. You know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I would. A true I, I, goat. I, I would say tall. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's my one word. George Marison's tall. There that you would go. be the most accurate, fair assessment. Yes, <laughs> tall. Good job, on. Good job. All right, Andrew, thank you so much. Before we leave, where can people find you? Where can they find um, your company? Where, where? Throw out all the links, all the socials, all the handles. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You can check us out on our website at www.othellogroup.com. On social, we are at Othello Group across the board. Uh, And my personal handle is virtually astallings88 on just about everything as well. So A lot of hockey tweets, just so you know, people. (laughs) A lot of hockey tweets, just like I have a lot of the Curse of Oak Island tweets and dog (laughs) tweets. I don't know. Follow up. Follow with caution, indeed. Follow with, there you go, there you go. Um, And all those uh, links will be in the show notes, tripodpodcast.com. I thank you for listening. Andrew, any last words? I I just love and enjoy conversations like this, Ross, ones that all stem from historical relationships and different chapters of our life. I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud to call you a mentor, a friend. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I miss you, brother. Thank you. Yeah, man. Me too. I, I miss you too. We need to we need to come up with some scheme where we can get together again. Um, there's a place right down the street from me that sells cheer wine. Um, it will be on the Super Bowl menu. So I'm, I'm actually glad you you remembered and called that back. And, um, you know, I will say this. It will feel maybe more um, paternal than I want it to. But, like, I truly to this day am so incredibly proud of so many of the interns that um, I hired. That was literally I will always fondly look back on that time of my life and to see so many of these interns being successful in things that they are passionate about and starting their own companies and, and, and just doing what you're doing. Um, I just keep peddling, man. I'm so proud of you. And uh, I can't wait to see, what you do. And I can't wait for in 18 months for you to create something that's going to turn uh, the entire digital content marketing world upside down. Yeah. I'm going to reinvent the toothpick. That's what it's going to be. <laughs> I heard it here first. Tripod podcast. Thanks for listening to Tripod. For show notes and bonus content, go to tripodpodcast.com. Connect with Tricycle Creative on Facebook and Instagram at Hello Tricycle. Connect with Ross at Ross Hero. Connect with Chris on Instagram at Ruthless Chris Steakhouse.